Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today in, an, in our institutional conference. Welcome, Dr. Chang, and thank you so much for being with us today. My name is Lorena Telles. I work at Lacario, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you to our moderators for this event. Dr. Juan Gabriel Sendales, Chief Executive Officer of Lacardio, and Dr. Julian Forero, member of the Radiology Department at Lacardio and fellow in cardiac imaging. Thank you uh, for moderating this event. Welcome. Hola a todos, buenas tardes, y muchas gracias a todos por su participación. Mi nombre es Julian Forero, soy radiólogo y trabajo en el Departamento de Imágenes Diagnósticas de Lacardio. Le recordamos que al conectarse a esta conferencia autorizan el tratamiento de sus datos personales, los cuales serán tratados de acuerdo a la ley 1581 de 2012 y nuestra política de datos personales, la cual puede consultar en www.cardioinfantil.org. De igual forma, le informamos que esta conferencia está siendo grabada. El chat de preguntas se encuentra habilitado en la barra de participantes y les agradecemos dejar allí sus inquietudes, las cuales reuniremos y transmitiremos al doctor Chang al final de la conferencia. Doctor Centralista. Bueno, muy buenas tardes eh, para todos. Doctor Chang, thank you for being with us. It's a, a pleasure. First, I want to uh, give some uh, greetings from a lot of friends that you have here in our institution. Uh, we have a lot of nurses that work with you around 1997 when you were the, the chief of the critical care unit in, in the Children's Hospital. I remember so very send, well, yeah, I remember very well. They send you, you a lot of greetings and also we have a lot of doctors. Dr. Sandoval is here with us. He's a close friend of you, we know that. And so for us, it's a, it's a pleasure for, for being here. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to speak in Spanish now. Uh, hoy tenemos el honor de contar con la participación del Dr. Anthony Chang eh, con la conferencia Inteligencia Artificial en Medicina y si es una oportunidad o una amenaza eh, para contarles un poco el doctor Chang eh, es eh, de una licenciatura en el John Hopkins en la Universidad de Biología Molecular después hizo eh, Medicina con eh, Georgetown University eh, y completó su residencia de pediatría en el Hospital Nacional Pediátrico eh, y obviamente su fellow en cardiología pediátrica en el hospital de Filadelfia eh, fue aceptado también como cardiólogo en el área de cuidado intensivo cardiovascular en el Children's Hospital en Boston eh, y profesor asistente del colegio eh, de médico en, en la Universidad de Harvard ha sido director de varias unidades de cuidado intensivo de programas eh, en Los Ángeles, en Miami, en Texas eh, y también ha sido el director del Instituto Cardiovascular eh, Pediátrico en Orange County, en California. Actualmente es el director de innovación eh, y de eh, inteligencia en, en, en el eh, programa del de hospital eh, pediátrico en Orange County eh, y ha sido también pues, galardonado con el premio de excelencia eh, por la Asociación Médica de Orange County, eh, uno de los primeros cardiólogos en, en tener estas posiciones como innovador y como innovación. So welcome, Dr. Chang. Uh, we'll start now and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me and, and um, uh, está muy amable. Uh, muchos saludos a mis amigos uh, en, en Colombia. Hace mucho, mucho años, <laughs> many years ago, but I remember, I have many, many great memories in Colombia, so thank you very much. Um, well, it's a privilege for me to talk about um, something new once again. I always bring something new, and that's the use of artificial intelligence in medicine. And I know uh, some of you have a, a heart cardiac focus, so we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Uh, so I assume that you saw my second slide. Uh, is it moving? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I always pause and give a uh, special tribute to the many doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists that uh, are working on the front lines. And uh, a few have even lost their lives. So it's a special tribute to them when I give a talk, uh, any talk this year. So thank you for all you do. Um, so I think, uh, how have we done with AI in the COVID pandemic? Well, uh, not so good, uh, could be better. 
Um, I think it's been good for interpreting medical images and perhaps even some decision support. But where it really, really did well was to be able to determine protein structure, as you can see here, of the viral proteins and enable us to design vaccines and drugs against the, the, the virus. So um, this is um, uh, a three-dimensional uh, picture of uh, AI-inspired uh, determination of the viral protein based on um, the genomic sequencing. So I think it's going to be a very exciting era for us to take advantage of artificial intelligence to help with drug design, drug repurposing, as well as vaccine design. So um, I, some of you probably remember Dr. Norwood by name. He's a pediatric heart surgeon from uh, the United States. And um, and um, he really was um, instrumental in inspiring me when I was a fellow in cardiology to get more involved in com complex mathematics and really inspire me to head in this direction. So I wanna also pay a special tribute to them. I had the chance to visit him many years later, um, uh, actually it was uh, last year uh, and um, it was the last time I saw him as he passed away earlier this year. But he really inspired me to the end to push um, mathematics into what we do in cardiology and in medicine. So um, if we look at AI, excuse me for one minute. Um, if you look at AI, we should think of it as a tsunami. Uh, Hollywood thinks of tsunami as a big giant tidal wave, but in fact, it's a very fast rising situation of water. So artificial intelligence is like a tsunami that there are a lot of things in our place already and uh, we just need to take advantage of this as a resource. So uh, as an example of this in cardiology, um, I had, this is one of the projects I did when I was uh, returning to school to learn about artificial intelligence. And this is uh, an MRI, as you know, of a patient with tetralogy of Fallot and an echocardiogram. So with artificial intelligence and programming, you can actually uh, combine the two images, which had, believe it or not, had not done before. So I think one of the reasons for learning artificial intelligence is gives you a new set of tools to be able to uh, do things that you were not able to do before. So AI as a resource tool is very important. Uh, this is um, what's happening in the operating room. So traditionally, uh, tools like this uh, in the operating room, uh, a surgeon takes a sample and the sample is uh, prepared for the pathology lab. But now you can actually have a artificial intelligence in the operating room in the form of deep learning and the, the image the specimen is put into the computer with artificial intelligence and you can actually get interpretation of this tissue within a uh, hundred seconds um, rather than waiting 20, 30 minutes. So it's a very impressive way to have AI help you in the operating room. So artificial intelligence can be a very effective tool to um, increase diagnostic prediction and as a, as a resource as well to improve patient outcome. And if you look at cardiology as a field, the interest in artificial intelligence has really uh, been exponential in the last uh, two or three years. But before then it was relatively quiet. So I think we're catching up to radiology in terms of having a lot of interest in this area. Based on a number of publications, so it's a great research methodology tool as well. So, um, and it's not going to replace doctors. Artificial intelligence is going to add, I think the joy of practicing cardiology and cardiac surgery uh, because um, the artificial intelligence is good at uh, using uh, itself uh, for perception and it doesn't take over cognition. So it's good at interpreting medical images and 
do analytics, but humans are still better at complex decision making and creative problem solving, and that won't change. So um, uh, there's an operation, uh, even a simple operation will not, um, I think, be uh, done by a robot anytime soon. So doctors should not have to re re uh, sort of fear that AI will replace them. In fact, it's going to make their jobs, I think, more enjoyable. So AI is an augmentation, not as a replacement. I think one of the most important things to appreciate is that the majority of issues with AI right now is, is with data. Data is the bottom layer uh, of resource that we need to fix before we can benefit from AI, which is at the top. So we need to really, really work on healthcare data as a source. So um, just as an example, um, the area of convolutional neural network, which is a special kind of AI tool, and it's a deep learning tool, it has really there has been a Cambrian explosion of these tools that are now available to look at cardiac MRIs and even cardiac echocardiography. So an exciting, exciting time to look at cardiac imaging. Uh, it's uh, basically helped by these tools. So if we look inside the computer, uh, this is what these tools are doing. Um, it's a combination of two processes called uh, convolution and pooling that is basically teaching the computer to read a medical image with a high degree of accuracy. So right now, computers can read cardiac MRIs as accurately, if not better, than even groups of cardiologists. So that's going to make the cardiologist's job a lot easier to have a computer as a partner in looking at medical images. Um, this is something called transfer learning. So by teaching the computer how to read cardiac MRIs, then every single project after that will be much faster and better and more accurate. So that's the exciting thing about what we're doing with transfer learning. Um, this is um, something called GANs or Generative Adversarial Network is synthesizing new data that computers can learn from, which is very exciting as well. Particularly if we're dealing with relatively rare heart diseases or different diseases that are rare in manifestation, we can use the computer to actually generate more examples to learn from. This is some work in dermatology where certain skin lesions can be diagnosed by, um, uh, by artificial intelligence. And now it's available uh, soon in the United States to help people uh, diagnose their own skin problem and perhaps uh, bring this to the attention of doctors. Um, this is in uh, ophthalmology. Now we can diagnose important diseases like diabetes uh, with a fundus photograph by diabetic retinopathy. So artificial intelligence is very involved in making that diagnosis. This is in pathology. This is excellent work from Stanford, incorporating the doctor, the pathologist into the process of working with the computer to increase the accuracy of the diagnosis. So this is using artificial intelligence as a very important uh, diagnostic partner in, in making a better diagnosis. Again, this is in radiology, a so, uh, very related field to cardiology, where it's not only helping interpreting the medical image, but it's helping with the entire workflow of um, radiologists. So that's going to be a very exciting area in cardiology. I think one word of caution about AI in image interpretation is we need to find clinical relevance. Um, this is an excellent paper by a Japanese group that used artificial intelligence to assess QPQS or the flow of pulmonary to systemic circulations. While it's a real tour de force in data science and AI in looking at medical images, but you wonder is a pediatric cardiologist or cardiac surgeon really going to rely on data science to make a judgment about timing of surgery? Probably not. It's going to look at clinical situations. So we have to look at clinical relevance. Um, this is uh, a work on using AI for pediatric and adult congenital uh, cardiac MRI. And it's really, really helping make a better diagnosis, especially in the areas of determination of ventricular sizes as well. So there are many, many really amazing applications in cardiology. This is using artificial intelligence and machine learning in cardiac arrhythmias because these are medical images too. 
and it's particularly good at finding new uh, phenotypic expressions of uh, different types of arrhythmias and prioritize them and rank them in terms of risk. So this is particularly useful. Um, this is another area of using AI uh, for image uh, recognition and acquisition. So AI can be involved in getting the images correct. And this is being uh, looked at as a possible way to use artificial intelligence is to getting the signal in the first place. Uh, artificial intelligence can also be very helpful in complex management of different diseases like congestive heart failure. Um, before, every cardiologist will have their own patients, their own way of doing something. But what if we put all the patients together and use artificial intelligence to look at the data and come up with very, very precise plans of therapy for each particular patient based on the whole cohort rather than just an individual doctor's experience. So we can really increase the amount of experience and intelligence for patients. I think one truly exciting area of using artificial intelligence is using something called unsupervised learning to really discover new subtypes of diseases that we're very used to seeing like pulmonary hypertension. This is uh, work out of Stanford looking at uh, using artificial intelligence to have new diagnoses of different subtypes of pulmonary hypertension. We should no longer think that pulmonary hypertension should be classified based on experts' opinions, and, um, but also rely more on data to help us with um, making the diagnosis. This is using artificial intelligence and natural language processing. Natural language processing is a way for computers and humans to communicate. And this is using natural language processing to predict disease. In this case, is peripheral vascular disease. And this can be easily applied to pediatric heart patients as well. So many, many areas are already being discovered. And I think um, very importantly, um, this is um, the American College of Cardiology uh, Innovation Council looking at what an ideal um, data science and AI project should look like. As you can see, there are many, many steps, but I think we're getting very good refinement of these technologies and resources to help uh, cardiologists from all over the world. And the most important aspect is using all of these planes of information and using artificial intelligence to achieve uh, precision cardiovascular care which will be much better for our patients than just putting them on a protocol and, and giving them the same dose of medication. So I think there are many, many exciting uh, potential uses of artificial intelligence that will be very, very powerful to help patients in general. So all these planes of information can be uh, collapsed and, and analyzed and help each individual patient. So in essence, we're gonna look at the future of artificial intelligence as a special resource that can help many, many different parts of the hospital to achieve what we need to achieve. So this is potentially um, the future of surgery. This is thanks to a colleague of mine, Dr. Toponsky. Imagine how this could be in the future. Um, this uh, is a computer teaching a surgeon, uh, helping a surgeon to do an operation. Perfect place. I think it's best to make your incision right here. Here is the minor fissure. Here is the front of the major fissure. I would start right here and unroof the cyst. Follow this plane right here. The superior segment artery should be near there. Okay, so perhaps we're several decades from a Norwood procedure being done this way, but I think in the future, there will be help from the computer and artificial intelligence. One of the most exciting areas in artificial intelligence right now is something called natural language processing that I mentioned before. And there's something called GPT-3, which is going to be truly, truly uh, revolutionary in looking at ways that computers and humans can uh, communicate. And I think that's going to be uh, a, a much, much better process. Another big area is something called edge computing pushing artificial intelligence to the edge like peripheral nervous system. So all the devices that we have now is capable of adopting an artificial intelligence component. So imagine the heart monitors can have artificial intelligence embedded inside 
So it will automatically notify the cardiologist if there's a problem with the rhythm, as opposed to going to a data repository, gets analyzed and then communicated with a cardiologist. It will be automatically relayed to the cardiologist in the near future. So I think this is a very, very exciting area. And one of the most exciting areas is the concept of uh, AI and swarm learning. I remember uh, many uh, uh, memorable moments when I was in Colombia about 20 years ago, um, perhaps longer, uh, 25 years ago. And I remember our first patient with nitric oxide uh, in Medellin, Colombia. And wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, rather than having doctors from other places around the world, you can just learn from other doctors without having them physically in your center, but you can gain from their insight and knowledge. So I think that's what we're aiming for is swarm intelligence, something called swarm learning or swarm intelligence is one of my areas of research right now. And I think also to learn um, and also have patients benefit from uh, extended reality, which is uh, virtual and augmented reality to, to see what their potential future heart operation will look like or to learn about the heart anatomy, I think will be really wonderful as a resource as well that will use artificial intelligence. And lastly, I think artificial intelligence will be very powerful for something called a virtual twin. As a matter of fact, there is already ongoing work in creating a virtual version of the patient so that you can try different things like biventricular pacing or different medications. And rather than trying in a patient the first time live, so you can actually create a model of the patient virtually to experiment the different therapies. Very, very exciting area in the future, especially with um, heart transplant, ventricular assist devices, bioventricular pacing. So if you're um, interested in artificial intelligence, I've created a two-day review course for those of you who are interested. Um, and these are the dates. Uh, you really learn a lot in two days. And um, I've written a book called Intelligence-Based Medicine, which is about artificial intelligence and medicine, but I'm also working on a book called Intelligence-Based Cardiology that will be out next year. Now focus on AI use in cardiology and cardiac surgery. I think you would really enjoy that book. I'm also the editor in chief of a journal called Intelligence Based Medicine that has cardiology articles as well. So um, please check these references out. We also have a society that meets uh, once a month that with clinicians that are interested in AI. And I want to thank um, my wonderful team, the Medical Intelligence and Innovation Team at Children's Hospital Orange County and also my many good friends and mentors at Stanford School of Medicine that really taught me a lot in a very short time. So thank you very much. And here's my, um, uh, this is a quote from Albert Camus to hopefully help us through this terrible pandemic is, uh, we used to think this summer was gonna be good, but I hope next summer will be good. And I look forward to coming back to Columbia someday. And here's my uh, contact information, Juan. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for your outstanding uh, presentation. Now we will start a Q&A session. So first we will, we will uh, take the question in Spanish and then we will translate it to you. So, Julian. Okay, okay Dr. Sendales. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chang. So uh, as we were mentioning, uh, first we will read the question in Spanish so everybody in the audience can understand and then you can uh, give us your answer, okay? Um, entonces, para todos vamos a, a leer eh, las preguntas que tenemos. Las vamos a agrupar en algunos temas que son eh, como parecidos para, para, para reunir respuestas que son similares. Eh, y después la voy a traducir para, para que el Dr. Chang nos dé, nos dé su respuesta. Entonces, dentro del grupo de preguntas que tienen que ver con generalidades acerca de inteligencia artificial, eh, una de las preguntas que era reiterativa era cómo volver la inteligencia artificial un aliado en cada una de las especialidades y no, y no una competencia. Entonces, Dr. Chan, one of the questions that we had uh, in different forms that I'm grouping here in a, like in a common question is, how do you make artificial intelligence an ally and not a threat? How do you make, how do you make it work with you and for you and not against you. Um, we have uh, radiologists, cardiologists, surgeons in our audience. Uh, for each of these fields, how, how would you accomplish that? 
I think the best way to really guarantee that is to know and understand this resource and and work with this resource rather than uh, be intimidated by it. And I think um, many clinicians who do not do computer programming or know data science are often very shy about getting involved. But you should get involved because you have the most valuable asset in this AI and healthcare and medicine domain, which is your clinical knowledge and your expertise in your subspecialty. And data scientists did not go to medical school, so they need your help to work on these projects. So I think perhaps the best answer is to really embrace it rather be intimidated or uh, not think that it's gonna be useful. It's the only way we're gonna survive this uh, tremendous surge in data and information. The only way we can survive is to use artificial intelligence in the, in the near future and in the far future as well. Okay, thank you. We, we have another question regarding uh, ethics. So okay. actually it's our president of, of our ethics committee of the hospital <laughs> okay. and she asks, and she asks about the the, the impact of uh, of uh, intelligence uh, artificial intelligence in in the in the in the ethics of the patient. Es la pregunta que tiene que ver con inteligencia artificial y ética. De hecho, la hace la presidenta de nuestro comité de ética del hospital y es esa relación entre ética y inteligencia artificial. No, I get this question very often. So I think when we talk about ethics and artificial intelligence, almost everyone thinks that we have to look at the ethics of using AI and make sure it's equitable, make sure there's no mistakes, make sure that we that the AI will actually help with patient outcome. But may I suggest that we ask the other half of the prob, uh, question, which is what's the ethics of not deploying AI? So if you have a tool that's very mature and that's very reliable and people know that they understand how it works, is it ethical not to use that tool? And I think when we talk about ethics and artificial intelligence, we have to think about the ethics of using it and the ethics of not using artificial intelligence, which I think should be raised, uh, especially as AI gets better and faster and more accurate. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shank. Um, la siguiente pregunta que tenemos es de um, Héctor Medina, nuestro eh, director de, de, de eventos y educación continuada, que es además el coordinador de enfermedades de cardiología, nos pregunta eh, cómo impactaría esto en estudios clínicos randomizados. So, Dr. Shank, um, another question that we're, that we're getting here is um, in terms of education and research, uh, how can AI impact the efficacy of randomized clinical trials? I mean, the analysis of all those information, can, can it be, uh, will we get different uh, results? Can we get different conclusions after we use these tools? Yes, I think, um, first of all, uh, it's not really competitive with when randomized controlled trials. Uh, randomized controlled trials is sort of top down and artificial intelligence is bottom up. So I think the two should combine and, and find answers. But I do think if you rely entirely on randomized controlled trials in the future, I think that the resulting dividend will be smaller and smaller. Because I think, I think um, randomized controlled trials is just not um, good enough to accommodate all the information and data. And we really need the support of data science to actually get to answers of the questions we have. And so I think RCTs or randomized controlled trials will have a limited role, more limited role in the future. And we should explore uh, data science and artificial intelligence more for getting uh, answers to our question, many, many questions. Thank you for, for your response. Eh, tenemos ahora una pregunta que, que las hemos tratado de, digamos, de, de unificar. Eh, tiene que ver con el tema de infraestructura, digamos, tecnológica que debería tener eh, un hospital para optimizar la implementación de, de inteligencia artificial y todo, digamos, el apoyo de los de la historia clínica digital. So, Dr. Chang, eh, eh, which is the IT infrastructure that a heart hospital should need to optimize the, the implementation of AI and, and, and which type of eh, electronic medical record 
or or software that we need to 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 build this on yeah it's um in terms of looking at projects with decision support and and uh, it will be hard if you don't have an electronic record um so one of the first things uh, you should do if you want to make electronic record your source of data is to convert it into electronic format um medical imaging medical imaging will be easier because you can just uh, look at the medical images you don't need um, a wealth of electronic record but the bottom line is you have to organize your data and make sure data is accurate make sure you can label the data for um, really good um, results from artificial intelligence and i think coming back to your resource question it just takes one Colombian uh, to be interested in artificial intelligence or learn from it and that that person can teach others and then you have a team so you do at some point need a team of people that are uh, knowledgeable in this area to have impact in using artificial intelligence in Colombia. Ok, entonces la, la siguiente pregunta la, la vamos a hacer que si, siguiendo con esta misma idea de analizar el efecto que la inteligencia artificial puede tener en una sociedad como la nuestra. Uh, Dr. Shang, keeping up with this uh, type of questions that are, uh, we find that many of our, of, of, of our audience um, want to know about the applications of uh, AI in a country like ours. For example, there is an interesting question here that says, is it possible to save costs? I mean, can AI become a really useful tool for a low or middle income country? For example, can we develop our own um, solutions? Should we buy external solutions? Um, how, 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 how big of an impact can AI be for, for, for a country like ours, like Colombia? I think the impact will be as big as you want it to be. Uh, I think the technology is very straightforward. You can save a lot of money by redirecting resources and looking at your pattern of utilization, uh, making sure that we don't make mistakes in, in easy things like testing. But there are a lot of things you can do outside of clinical medicine in the hospital that will help reduce cost. And that's uh, something called robotic process automation, which is a fancy term for basically algorithms that can run your hospital that will reduce cost. So I think um, one of the most important parts of this is you have to have good data. You have to have data that's available in an electronic format because computers cannot work with handwriting and people that write. So one of the first things you'll have to do is convert everything to electronic format to really benefit from AI in the future. Tenemos otra, otras dos preguntas. La, la, la primera tiene que ver con mirando un poco el futuro, eh, si vale la pena incluir en el currículum médico de entrenamiento de pregrado o de posgrado, elementos como por ejemplo programación, matemáticas, eh, lenguaje, digamos de programación, por ejemplo. So, so the first question, Dr. Chang, it's looking uh, into the future, should we include in our medical curriculum uh, of undergraduate or fellow uh, things like mathematics, uh, uh, programming, uh, Python, uh, uh, programming, coding, uh, how, how should we manage that? I think the best thing for most clinicians to do is get involved, but not learn programming and not learn computer science right away. Because I think uh, that you have good computer science in Colombia. So you should you know, form partnerships with your data scientists and computer scientists to work in healthcare rather than having every doctor learn programming, which I think is not very efficient. Maybe a few. Uh, will want to learn. I, I wanted to learn, so I learned, but I think the overall, you know, um, result is better if people just focus on what AI is, uh, how you can use AI in clinical medicine, how you can use AI to save money, how you can save, use AI to have better patient outcome. That's more important than learning how to program. You know, I'll, I'll draw you an analogy. So if you have a, a musical symphony, and the clinicians are the, the string players playing the violin. And now you have a bigger symphony with trumpets, with uh, woodwinds, with percussion, drums. Uh, you don't want to jump seat and learn how to play the drums. You need to learn how to play with the drums, but you don't need to play the drums yourself. 
So I think I always suggest to the doctors um, learn programming, but you don't have to learn at a very fast pace. Just learn programming, learn to appreciate what it is, have fun with programming. Uh, if you're not having fun programming, you should not learn how to program because it's very, very difficult and very tedious. So most doctors don't have to learn to program to be effective in uh, adopting artificial intelligence in medicine to help patients. Great. And, and the second question regarding barriers, uh, basically, uh, how can a traditional hospital uh, 1.0 version should go to the 4.0 version <laughs> uh, and, and which are the barriers uh, are there uh, technical barriers like uh, infrastructure or it's uh, change management with the with the doctors with nurses or maybe the, management, maybe the management team uh, entonces la pregunta tiene que ver si uh, como estas barreras digamos de transformación de pasar un hospital de la primera versión al, a la versión 4.0, que es esta inteligencia artificial, si las barreras son tecnológicas o son de gestión de cambio eh, o son de administración. No, as you probably suspected, the usual problem is people, not the, the IT or the computer. Um, I think we have to have people change their mindset about how to use a modern resource like artificial intelligence. And I see another related question. Yes, we're... And under the American Board of AI Medicine, we are developing, uh, we have a two-day review program, we have an educational certification, we're working on getting clinician cert board certification that will be coupled with two years of specialized training in artificial intelligence and medicine. So all of that is coming. <laughs> and I think uh, it's very necessary to establish artificial intelligence and medicine as a separate field, you know, sub sub, sub area just like interventional catheterization, as you said, electrophysiology. It needs people with special focus. And even those people don't necessarily need to, have to learn how to program. They need to understand the principles of artificial intelligence, but not necessarily how to program. So that's the good news. Yeah, that's the good news. Uh, otra, cosa que, otra pregunta que, que tenemos aquí varias agrupándolas es cómo hacer una evaluación de las herramientas en inteligencia artificial. Dr. Shang, since many tools most likely will become available that deal with artificial intelligence, right? And many of them will have huge uh, amounts of data that support the results that they are getting. Uh, in the future, how could we evaluate all those different technologies to decide which one's best for us? For example, a software uh, to evaluate uh, chest x-rays or uh, abdominal CTs or cardiac MRIs. Because uh, Many of us can see that many companies will try to make their own versions of this uh, using this amount of data or this or that. What would be the, the way to know which of these tools would most likely be many of them doing the same thing? How to evaluate them? Should they be, uh, is it better to have an academic association on board, let's say the RSNA or the ACC uh, that validates this or that tool? Because many of us think that many tools will become available. Yeah, it's a good question because there's no formal way to assess these companies. And even if you assess them, you can't guarantee they're going to be the same six months later, you know, either better or worse. So um, it has to be a continual process to evaluate them. And I always think that maybe machines can evaluate machines. You know, it's like Alan Turing's comment, why are human beings trying to figure out the turn, the, um, the Enigma machine, why can't uh, a machine deal with the Turing, uh, with the uh, uh, Enigma machine during the Second World War? And I think he's right. Maybe an algorithm to figure out the efficiency and the accuracy of another algorithm and not necessarily have only humans trying to evaluate. So I think it's gonna be combined human and AI, you know, um, uh, mechanism to check the the efficiency and accuracy of AI tools in the future. Okay, and we have, we have another question regarding uh, medical education and basically, do, do you think we anticipate a super fellowship in, in uh, AI? Uh, yes. Like, like we train uh, interventional car, cardiology, electrophysiology. Uh, yes. La pregunta es si, si esperamos tener un super eh, especialista en inteligencia artificial aplicada a cardiología o a radiología. 
Yes, I'm working on that, trying to form a fellowship in artificial intelligence and medicine. I think it's going to be very, very necessary for maybe one to five, one to five percent of clinicians to be specialists in this area. Uh, so every cardiology group, every radiology group, every pathology group will have someone specializing in artificial intelligence for the future. That will be, I think, almost a certainty because the technology is sophisticated and very valuable. So Dr. Chang, thank you very much for your lecture. Thank you very much for the mm -hmm. answers that you've given us. Um, here at La Cardio, we want to we want to learn about the AI and we want to be there when it gets here. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think the important Muchas thing gracias. is to identify yes. maybe one or two champions and that person can do a lot in your institution. So happy to connect with that champion if you identify that person. Thank you, Dr. Chang. A toda nuestra audiencia, muchísimas gracias. Gracias por acompañarnos en esta conferencia institucional eh, acerca de inteligencia artificial. Gracias a los organizadores. Doctor Sendales, muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, esperamos que haya sido del agrado de todos ustedes. Esperamos forma que nos reúnen agrupando las, las dudas y todas las inquietudes que todos teníamos. A todos, hasta luego y muchísimas gracias. Doctor Shank, thank Con you. Con mucho gusto. Much. Gracias.